Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom. This is a very special episode because this is the first in a new series in which I will be talking you through all the ins and outs of some of my favorite books in the world of self-help or personal improvement or whatever you want to call it. Um, basically, trying to unlock a lot of the knowledge that exists in some of the these awesome books. So the first one I have to start with is Boom! Atomic Habits. This book is so awesome. It's had such an impact on my life. There are reasons why James Clear has become probably rich and famous because of this. Um, gosh, there are just so many awesome practical takeaways in this book. But here's what I worry about is that even though this has sold like millions and millions of copies and so many people have read it, um, are they actually implementing this in their daily lives? If you're like me, you read this book maybe a couple years ago and you're like, oh my God, that was so awesome and this and that. But now you're like, oh shoot, am I actually implementing that in my life? Well, listen, that's what the whole point of this series is. I break down, I'm literally gonna go through this book, break it down, explain it to you, talk about some of the best, most practical uses that you can get out of this book. And I'm gonna try to like really personalize it for you to make it really relevant and actionable. Um, highly, highly recommend this book. And uh, I can't wait to get into talking about it with you. So let's dive in. This is Atomic Habits Explained. All right, so who is this James Clear guy anyhow? And why does he know so much about habits? Well, to help us understand this, Clear actually opens up Atomic Habits with a story about his past, one that turns out to be uh, really quite consequential, in fact. Um, now, the last day of his sophomore year in high school, and he grew up in uh, Ohio, uh, Clear gets accidentally hit in the face with a baseball bat. He's a baseball player. Actually, uh, interesting little note about this story is that his dad apparently played uh, professional baseball. I've been a big James Clear fan for like five years and didn't quite internalize that fact. Um, but uh, so Clear's a baseball player in high school. Last day, last day of sophomore year, gets hit in the face with a bat. I guess the kid is swinging the bat, flings out of his hands, kind of hits Clear in the face, basically crushes his nose in his face, has a bunch of broken bones, but uh, it gets pretty serious pretty fast. He loses consciousness. They need to get him to the hospital ASAP, he starts having a bunch of seizures, uh, long story short, he gets airlifted from his small town hospital to a hospital in Cincinnati. They end up having to put him into a medically induced coma. So like very, very serious stuff. And this is uh, when he's in high school. Um, ends up having a very uh, long recovery coming out of that. So he has to work on everything from, you know, walking to, you know, all the basic uh, motor skills. But he comes back. He, he does it. He eventually kind of gets his footing under him uh, again, comes back his junior year and uh, another kind of punch in the face, so to speak. But he ends up being the only junior to get cut from the varsity baseball team that year. And again, his dad had played professional baseball. So that's probably even more of a hit to the ego. Only, only plays uh, 11 total innings in his senior year of high school. So all the while, um, he's you know kind of working on his comeback from this injury, uh, but just doesn't really have the success uh, as a baseball player. So ends up finishing high school, goes to Denison University in Ohio, uh, where he decides to walk on to the baseball team as a freshman. He actually makes the baseball team um, as a freshman. And it's here at Denison in college where he really starts to find his footing and starts to figure out the power of focusing on these small habits. And he had started to kind of figure that out with uh, re re recovering from his injury and learning these motor skills and stuff like that. But he starts really dialing in the habits and just like small stuff, like keeping his room clean in college, um, kind of dialing in the study habits, um, you know, and, and it's, he's finding that the, the more he does these little things, he's just getting more and more confidence, ends up getting straight A's his freshman years. And he starts lifting weights multiple times a week. Again, just really dialing in the habits. So he ends up like, that ends up being a pretty transformational year of college for him. He comes back sophomore year. Again, he was a walk-on freshman year. Comes back sophomore year of uh, college and he turns himself into a starting pitcher. So, okay, this is a guy, remember, back in junior year, he's getting cut from the varsity team, major injury, walk-on, 
starting pitcher now. Okay, pretty good. Fast forward to junior year, all of a sudden he's voted the uh, team captain and the power of all those little habits. Again, it's even just silly little things like keeping his room clean um, and, and, and getting to the gym really consistently um, during the week starts to really pay off. Gets voted team captain junior year. Then senior year, he gets voted the top male athlete at Denison. Again, not to belabor the point, but he was a walk-on, okay? Um, top male athlete at Denison. That's across all sports. And he makes the ESPN All-American academic team. Also earns the university's highest honor, the President's Medal. So this kid, as a junior in high school, cut from the varsity squad, ends up figuring out habits, ends up uh, what he says, you know, hey, I never made it pro, but uh, I achieved something more important and that's that I fulfilled my potential. Um, so that's pretty cool. So, but anyways, that is just a little bit of background on where he started to figure out why habits are so important in the, in the major impact that he started to see um, in, in his life. And so he looks back at that injury of getting smashed in the face with that bat as kind of forming the foundation for uh, all things habit and habit change. And he basically learned the power of taking small, seemingly inconsequential actions on their own, but doing them consistently. And that's a big, big, big theme in this book um, and how that ultimately lets the magic of compounding do its work. And we're going to talk about compounding um, throughout this um, overview of this book. So that's what this book is all about, small habits, atomic habits, and how they ultimately grow into something massive. So we'll dive into the mechanics of what Clear has learned about habits and how he proposes uh, that we both forge new ones and kick bad ones. Um, but just a quick note, uh, actually, that I wanted to highlight. I love this at the end of his introduction just because I'm a sucker for humility. But he says, anything wise in these pages, you should credit to the many experts who preceded me. Anything foolish, it is my error. And uh, I can tell you there's not a lot of foolish things in this book. This is, uh, it's, it's a masterpiece and it's the reason why it sold millions of copies. Um, so anyways, let's, uh, let's dive into some of the ideas here. So to illustrate the power of very small changes, Clear starts out with a story about the British national cycling team. Basically, they were very, very terrible for a very long time. So they had zero wins in 110 years competing in the Tour de France. When they hired Dave Brailsford in 2003 as their new performance coach, his philosophy, and this is going to be more and more familiar to you as we cover what's in this book, uh, but his philosophy is the aggregation of marginal gains, aka searching for a tiny margin of improvement in everything you do, in other words, many small improvements, ultimately equates to meaningful change. So Brailsford, this guy comes in, you know, British cycling team, terrible, hasn't won Tour de France in 110 years. He comes in, starts changing everything, but just like little tiny changes, right? So he like, he looks at the bike seats that they have. He's like, okay, well, maybe we could just tweak those a little bit. He looks at the bike shorts these guys are wearing. All right, is there something we can change there? He even looks at things like the pillows these guys are sleeping on, the mattresses they're sleeping on, even like what kind of massage gel they're using. And is there one that, that can promote faster recovery? It's, I mean, it is like the the epitome of tiny changes, but he's finding like hundreds of them, okay? Now, fast forward to 2008. Okay, remember they hired this guy in 2003. Um, so five years later, uh, these little changes are starting to compound. And guess what? The Brits, they go to the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and they dominate, okay? This is a new thing for them. They win 60% of the cycling gold medals. Four years later at the Olympics in London, the Brits set nine Olympic records and seven world records, okay? These guys came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden, they're dominating. The same year, a Brit wins the Tour de France for the first time, Bradley Wiggins. The next year, his teammate, Chris Froome, wins. And then they win again in 2015, 2016, 2017. The Brits win the Tour de France five out of six years. They hadn't won it in 110 years, okay? So... Clear believes that uh, this really illustrates the power of small changes. If you get 1% better each day, and this is this stat's a little overquoted, but I like it anyways. If you get 1% better each day for one year, you end up 37 times better. 
1% better each day for one year, you end up 37 times better. That's the magic of exponential growth and compounding. If you get 1% worse every day, on the other hand, you basically decline to zero, okay? And that equates to anything you're doing in your life. So habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. That is the first of many, many quotes I'm going to quote and emphasize from Clear because this book is just full of them. And uh, by the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of my favorite quotes from this book. I'm going to put them in a newsletter for you so that you don't have to try to take notes on this podcast or memorize anything. I'm going to make it super easy. Uh, so each day, Clear says, looks insignificant on its own. It's only when looking back, the value of good habits and the cost of bad ones becomes strikingly apparent. A slight change in daily habits is akin to shifting the route of an airplane by a few degrees. Eventually, you end up in a very different place. Clear as conclusion, you should be far more concerned about your current trajectory than your current results. And I love this line. Your outcomes are a measure, sorry, your outcomes are a lagging measure of your habits, okay? I want to repeat those two things. You should be far more concerned about your current trajectory than your current results, and your outcomes are a lagging measure of your habits. Again, I'm going to take all these quotes that I love so much and put them in a newsletter for you. He says, your net worth is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning habits. In other words, you get what you repeat. By the way, I can really appreciate how much time was spent crafting every single word of this book by the stunning number of gems like this. Um, this is one of the highest density of insight per word books I've ever read in my life. Another great way to clear words this concept, time magnifies the margin between success and failure. Good habits make time your ally. Bad habits make time your enemy. I'm just bolding that one as I record this because I'm like, yeah, I'm going to include that in the newsletter as well. That one's really cool. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, we all know that it can take a little while to see the benefits of our good habits. Clear says, habits often appear to make no difference until you cross a critical threshold and unlock a new level of performance. Like any compounding process, the most powerful outcomes are delayed. This is why it's hard to get new habits to stick. It's the equivalent of heating ice cubes from 25 to 31 degrees. Uh, sorry, my European friends, we're talking about, we're talking about a Fahrenheit right here. Um, all the action happens at 32. Uh, but the effort was not wasted. The effort to heat the ice cube from 25 to 31 was not wasted, even though all the action happens at 32. We just need to break through what he calls the plateau of latent potential. That's what leads to quote-unquote overnight successes. The world, of course, does not see all the work that was done in the dark. So how do we do this? Well, Here's something, a uh, little counterintuitive idea that Clear asserts. He says, forget about goals. Okay, that may be something that you're not used to hearing. That's right. He says, forget about goals. Spoiler, he's going to suggest that we focus on systems instead. Now, he talks about the problems with goals. He, goals suffer from survivorship bias, right? So you could say, oh, well, wait a minute. Every person who's won a Olympic gold medal had a goal to win an Olympic gold medal. Yeah, that's that's for sure true, but... Didn't the person who won silver and bronze do it? Didn't they have a gold goal to win that gold medal as well? And all the other people who didn't medal. Um, so goals suffer from survivorship bias. Goals are a moment in time. Like, let's break it down to a really small one. I have a goal to clean my room, okay? that That's a moment in time, happens once or doesn't happen. A system, on the other hand, is changing your cleanliness habits. Goals imply delayed happiness, um, I'll be happy once, fill in the blank, once I do a marathon or once I lose weight, whatever. But when you fall in love with the process, Clear says, you don't have to wait to give yourself permission to be happy, okay? You can fall in love with the process. Um, so this can imply, this this one can imply to goals like how much money you want to make, how much weight you want to lift, the championship you want to win, Um Goals, Clear says, are about the results you want to achieve. Systems are about the processes that lead to those results. Or here's another way he asserts it. Goals are good for setting direction, but systems are best for making progress. So if you're not reaching your goals, don't worry about it. What you need is not a better or higher or more ambitious goal. What you need, according to Clear, is a better system. 
And again, back to his incredible lines. Sorry, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I just love it. Uh, we do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. That one is worth repeating. We do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. So the system, in a way, is setting a floor, a minimum level of what we are willing to accept of ourselves. Those are my words, not clears, but I think he would probably agree with the sentiment. So what we all should be asking ourselves now is, how do we build these systems? Well, the answer, no surprise, look at the name of the book, is with small marginal improvements with atomic habits. So let's define our terms here. An atomic habit, according to Clear, is a regular practice or routine that is not only small and easy to do, but the source of incredible power, a component of the system of compound growth. Okay, so let's talk about behavior change. Clear shows us that there are three layers of behavior change. One, outcomes. I ran a 5K. That's where most people focus. Two, process. I ran every day for two months. This is where most of the habits that you build are, should be associated with this level. And three, identity. I am a runner. Uh, this is where most of our beliefs, assumptions, and biases are at this level. This is also, by the way, the most powerful level. So in other words, outcome, outcomes are what you get, processes are what you do, and identity is what you believe. Consider these two reactions of someone resisting a cigarette. No thanks, I'm trying to quit. Versus, no thanks, I'm not a smoker. Clear says the ultimate form of intrinsic motivation is identity. You go from saying stuff like, I'm trying to run more, or I'm trying to write more, to I am a runner, or I am a writer. And true behavioral change, the type that really sticks, is actually identity change. And that's a big theme in this book, and I cannot emphasize it enough. It is super important, and I want to talk more about that because it's really impacted my life personally. Um, by the way, this works both ways. So how many times have you heard people say, oh, I'm, I'm just not a morning person, or, oh man, I'm just bad at remembering people's names, or I'm horrible at math? Are you? Or, I mean, is that really true? Or have you just accepted those identities because of a few bad experiences? These things are self-perpetuating both directions, good and bad. So once you kind of get going on an avenue of, I'm, I'm just bad at math, yeah, it kind of becomes self-perpetuating. So Claire says, if you want to become the best version of yourself, it requires you to continuously edit your beliefs and to upgrade and expand your identity. Now, most people don't consciously consider their identities in different parts of their lives. And most definitely aren't focusing on editing and upgrading and expanding these identities. This is one of the truly par powerful parts of this book, though, for me. Um, and, you know, I, I've really latched onto this idea of, of identity-based habits uh, quite a bit. And I can talk a little bit more about that. But um, this brings up an important question. Where do, I, where do our identities come from? Clear says they emerge from our habits, from what we repeatedly do. So... Do you go to the gym every day? Well, you are someone who is committed to fitness. That is part of your identity. Do you go to church every Sunday? Well, you are somebody who is religious. That's part of your identity. Do you study biology every night? Well, you are somebody who is studious. That's part of your identity. Clear talks about how his own identity of quote unquote writer emerged from writing blog posts twice a week for years. Um, I actually had a very similar experience with writing and, and podcasting. At some point, you cross this Rubicon where you're like, oh, guess I, am, I guess I am a podcaster. I guess I am a writer, right? I mean, <clears throat> it was really hard for me. I, I wrote a book like back in 2012 called CFA Confidential. And it was weird because like it was such an identity shift that I'm someone who is writing a book. You're like, oh, my, like the idea of like calling myself an author was like very weird. But eventually I got around to it and like, yeah, I wrote two books, you know, like uh, I'm an author, like I'm okay calling myself that that's part of my identity um so yeah i want to talk more about this because it's it's just hugely important um anyways in this way clear states another quote i love uh the process of building habits is actually the process of becoming yourself i'm going to compile all my favorite quotes from this book i said so uh just stay tuned for the newsletter but here's another one every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become 
Sorry, these are too good. I'm going to repeat both of them. The process of building habits is actually the process of becoming yourself. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. When the votes mount up, the story you will tell yourself about who you are begins to change. Of course, this works for bad habits too, but as Claire points out, you don't need a unanimous vote for a new identity. You need a majority. So here's how to put this into action. Decide the type of person you're trying to be and prove it to yourself every day with small wins. Now, I don't want to get too much into my personal story here, but here's the way I, I do this. Like, so I've, I've identified like, let's see, five or six different identities that I want to embody every day. Great dad, great husband, extremely fit man, um, creator, et cetera. I, I, have, I have several. And, and so what I've done is I've, I've kind of broken these down. It's like, okay, let me get, make this super simple. What would a great husband do on a daily basis? or a weekly basis? And can I literally schedule that? And can I tick boxes to make sure I'm doing that? What would a great dad do? What would an extremely fit man do? Like the fitness ones are pretty straightforward. Like what would an extremely fit man do every day? He would work out every day or at least six days a week, right? You know, whatever you can get more specific and say like for 45 minutes a day or whatever. But so that is part of my um, plan every day is I have this identity, extremely fit man, and I try to prove it every single day, basically by working out for 45 minutes, okay? The husband one is kind of interesting. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things I identified is a great husband would have great communication with his wife. Now, listen, we can all improve in communication in our relationships. One thing, I wanted to put like a line in the sand. So I scheduled, literally, I sent my wife a calendar invite, and I scheduled it in both of our calendars. We have a one-hour walk once a week, and we try it very, very hard not to miss it. And sometimes I have an agenda for that walk and have stuff we want to talk about, whatever. And sometimes I don't, but it is uh, just a line in the sand. A great husband would have open, honest, regular communication with his wife. And so that's just a boom. I tick that box. I even have one called a great husband would do one nice thing for his wife every day. And it's kind of funny. It's like, I have this in like a habit tracker and everything. And like, did I get to like 9 PM every night and sitting on the couch? I'm like, did I do the one nice thing today or not? If not, like, let me do something at 9 PM, like something super tiny. And it's kind of funny. Like, I think my wife was like, yeah, are you like just doing this to like tick a box? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I, I don't think she cares. Like who, who cares if somebody's doing something nice for you, do you really care what their motivation is? No. Like, so anyways, long story short, you can take this idea of identity and then break it down. I've written newsletters about this past. I can, I can dig them up and link them in the show notes to this one. So again, you become your habits. It's not some crazy secret on how to be a great dad or husband or executive or athlete. We all know what we need to do. We just need to do it. Simple, but not easy. So this is where establishing uh, habits and understanding the science behind all of it really comes into play. So why do we form habits anyways? Well, clear shows that basically our, it's our lazy brains uh, latching on to solutions that have worked in the past for us and ingraining those so we don't need to think about them every time. So for instance, I had bad breath and a gross taste in my mouth. Then I brushed my teeth. Now that problem is gone. You brush your teeth enough times and all of a sudden you've got something you don't need to think about anymore. A habit, right? Like, do you actually think about brushing your teeth or do you just do it on autopilot? I, I guess you probably do it on autopilot. Same with showering. Like, do you like make a big choice every day about showering? Probably not. It's you do it at the same time every day. It's on autopilot, right? It's just a, it's just a habit that happens. So um, it, this is important because your conscious mind can only focus on one thing at a time. Um, anything that we can kick over to that non-conscious mind, we, we really want to, and in our, in our, in our, we're naturally wired to. Now, one common question that comes up as it regards to um, habits and routines is, you know, if I'm doing the same thing all the time, doesn't that make my life boring? Um, and uh, Claire's got a little section in here about this, and uh, I, I've written about this in the past as well. But no, quite, quite the contrary. Um, the more routine you can make your life, uh, the more freedom you kind of uh, enable for yourself. So like Steve Jobs is probably the most famous example of this guy wore like the same black like turtleneck or whatever every single day. 
boom, don't need to think about clothes. Um, my brain is freed up to like dream up the next, you know, iPhone or whatever. Um, I, I try to do this on like a micro level. I basically eat the same thing for lunch every day. And it's just like, I don't want to waste brain power in the middle of my day to be like, oh, where should I go for lunch? Oh, is it healthy or not healthy? You know, this and that. No, so boom, this is what I do for lunch. All right, let me let my brain stay focused on this problem I'm trying to solve. All right, so let's get into the science of building habits so we can figure out how to hack our lazy brains into doing the right stuff. Um, Clear identifies four steps to building a habit. Cue, craving, response, and reward. Cue is something that triggers your brain to initiate a behavior. Craving is the motivational change or the desired state of change that you want to see. Response is the actual habit that you perform. And reward is what satisfies your craving and basically starts the whole feedback loop and habit cycle over again. Clear says, and I quote, if a behavior is insufficient in any of these four stages, it will not become a habit. Eliminate the cue and your habit will never start. Reduce the craving and you won't experience enough motivation to act. Make the behavior difficult and you won't be able to do it. And if the reward fails to satisfy your desire, then you'll have no reason to do it again in the future. So you got to have all four of these to make a habit stick. They are collectively known as the habit loop. Again, it's cue, craving, response, and reward. It's kind of like an operating system that's constantly running in the back of your brain that you're not even aware of for for most of the habits that you actually do, whether it be working out or even like brushing your teeth. You're, You're not even aware of all these stages, but it's going on in the background. So that's where Clear's four laws of behavioral change come in. And there, he basically attaches them to these four stages that we talk about. But law number one is make it obvious. That's the cue. For good habits, we want to make them obvious. For bad habits, we want to make them invisible. We'll talk more about what that means. Uh, Law number two, make it attractive. So this is the craving. So we have to make it something that we want to do or that we, you know, that we enjoy. Um, And for bad habits, we want to make bad habits unattractive. Uh, Law number three, make it easy. I love this one. And if it's a bad habit, make it difficult. And law number four, make it satisfying. Again, bad habit, make it unsatisfying. So if you want to create a positive habit in any part of your life, according to Clear, you just need to answer these four questions. How can I make it obvious? How can I make it attractive? How can I make it easy? And how can I make it satisfying? Clear asserts that any goal we are failing at, the weight we haven't lost, the business we never started, the cigarettes we never quit, the answer to our failures is found somewhere within these four questions. So if we can make our habits obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying, we exponentially improve our chances of success. And who doesn't want to do that? If we can't, we're almost surely destined to fail. So isn't that kind of interesting? If you're failing at something, go back and look at these four things the answer is probably somewhere in there. Now, the bulk of Atomic Habits is dedicated to deconstructing these four laws. I'm not going to give you every single piece of detail on them, but I'm going to hit the high points. And so let's, without further ado, dive right into it. Law number one, make it obvious. How can we make a habit obvious? Well, it turns out there's several layers to this, including just being aware of our own behavior and using cues like time and location to our advantage and setting up our environments in a smart way. That one is so huge. Um, I can't overstate it. So step one in changing habits starts with awareness. We need to observe ourselves almost, almost like we're observing another person. So for me, that might look something like this. Hmm. Interesting. Greg is checking Twitter again on his phone tip here is that we should say out loud the action that we are taking and what the outcome will be. Um, So for me, it might be like, Greg is checking Twitter. He may get some short-term dopamine from this, but this is probably getting him more addicted. And he's probably just procrastinating that podcast episode about atomic habits that he really wants to be working on right now. It's not a productive use of his time. He doesn't need it. Mm, Am I going to say that out loud? Probably not. But I may say out loud, like, Greg is checking Twitter. What the heck is he doing? Um, He actually, Clear actually tells a really interesting story in the book about uh, how the Japanese railroad system, of all things, 
uh, saw a massive decline in accidents after they implemented a so-called point and call system in which conductors verbally call out things like signal is green or platform is clear. There is something about verbally stating these things while visually checking them that has resulted in a massive drop in errors. Isn't that interesting? So if I'm eating a chocolate chip cookie, maybe I need to be saying something like, Greg is eating a chocolate chip cookie. He's probably not going to be happy about this five minutes from now. Clear says, Hear hearing your bad habits spoken aloud can make the consequences seem more real. So it basically just is this idea of awareness, right? And just looking for ways to sort of interrupt the autopilot, right? Jolt yourself out of the autopilot. Um, so awareness makes a habit more obvious. And that's what we're talking about here. Law number one, make it obvious. Okay, another thing that makes your habit more obvious, it turns out, is tying your habit to a specific time and location. In fact, the two most common cues for habits are time and location. Let me give you an example that Clear uses in the book. He cites research that shows that voter turnout markedly improves when voters are forced to answer questions like, what time do you plan to vote and which route do you plan to take to the voting station? So the punchline here is people who make a specific plan for when and where they will perform an action or, or in our case here, a new habit are much more likely to follow through. Think about that. People um, are much, much more likely to vote if they had to answer these questions. What time are you going to vote and which route are you going to take to get there? Very important idea that we can use to our advantage here. By the way, this whole idea of scheduling has become massively important in my life. It's probably the most productive change in my life I've made over the last five years. I started doing this um, every Sunday. I spend 15 to 30 minutes planning out my week. And I have I plan out all my workouts. I plan out uh, you know different stuff I'm going to I need to do from a, a a work perspective, a podcast perspective, um, a parent perspective. And I, importantly, I schedule it all on my calendar. It all gets scheduled in my calendar. So every workout, seven days are in the calendar. I'm going to do a zone two run for 45 minutes on Tuesday. I'm going to do my lifting routine one for 45 minutes on Wednesday. It's all in the calendar. It's been by far the most productive thing I've done in the last five years. And it is basically this principle in action. It is just setting a time and a location. Uh, I just absolutely love it. So Clear says, when you schedule something, back to another good quote, when you schedule something, it transforms it from intention to plan. I've 100% found that to be true. The flip side of that, what doesn't work is, I'm going to start working out more, or you know, I'm going to really write more, or I'm going to prioritize my relationship. Yeah, good luck. If it's not in your schedule, you're not doing it. Trust me. This is why this prioritized relationship one, literally for me, like I already told you, once a week, this is in my calendar with my life, we're going for a walk. That's prioritizing my, my relationship and it's gone from intention to plan because I literally have it in my schedule. Nothing else can get scheduled in that block. It's done. Now, further on this idea of making habits obvious, let's talk about how one habit can lead to another and how you can use this to an advantage. So Clear talks about something called the Diderot effect. Basically, this idea is like, if you purchase one thing, it leads to the purchase of lots of related things. I'm very aware of this right now because we are just about to get a dog and I've all of a sudden seen dog crates, dog food, collars, like total Diderot effect going on in my house right now with dog related things. So one thing happens, it cues a bunch of others. Now the same is true with our habits. So Clear uses this example. You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands, hopefully, please, please. Um, that reminds you to put dirty towels in the laundry. That reminds you to add laundry detergent to the shopping list and so on. So how to use this to your advantage? Instead of having your cue be based on time and location, in this case, you can have your cue be based on another already existing habit. So here's some example Clear gives. After I pour my morning coffee, uh, I will meditate for one minute, okay? You're already doing the coffee thing every day, so this is kind of stacking something onto that. After I take off my work shoes, I will immediately change into my workout clothes. 
Okay, you take off your work shoes every day, and so you're adding another habit onto that. After I sit down for dinner, I will immediately say one thing I'm grateful for. This is a cool one. I do this with my family, and uh, we, we all enjoy it. Um, the key, Clear says, is to tie your desired behavior to something you already do each day. This is called habit stacking. As you get more advanced, you can stack a bunch of habits together. After I have my coffee, I'll meditate. After I meditate, I'll write my to-do list for the day. After I write my to-do list for the day, I will begin the highest impact task, okay? That's like 201 level. Uh, that's a little more aspirational in my view. But I think more important is just uh, this idea of like, if there's already something you're doing every day, can you tie a something you want to be doing every day to it? So again, we're talking about law number one, make it obvious. Point here is, Clear says actually, uh, the more specific you can make the cue, the better, by the way. This is a really important tip here. So instead of, I'll do push-ups at lunch, like get more specific. I will do 10 push-ups in my office as soon as I close my laptop for lunch, okay? Um, take the ambiguity out of it. Make it specific and obvious, Clear says. Okay, so we talked about awareness. We talked about time and location, aka scheduling, which I am obviously a huge fan of. And we talked about habit stacking. Now, Let's talk about the final piece of law number one, make it obvious, and that is the importance of our environment because as CLEAR shows, it is very, very important. In fact, CLEAR argues that our habits change depending on the room we are in and the cues in front of us. He says, and I quote, and I probably stick it in my newsletter, environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. Environment is the invisible hand that shapes human human behavior. We love to think we're in control of our behavior at all times when in fact it is very often the function of the external environment we are operating in. There are endless examples of this and Clear talks about stuff like grocery stores. You think you're in control of what you're buying at the grocery store but really you're a slave to whatever is at eye level or whatever is on the end cap. There's a reason manufacturers pay so much more to have their products placed there because we are just uh, operating in our environments and sort of creatures are, of our environments. He also talks about um, things like, are we really making our own decision to go to Starbucks or are we going there because it's on our walk to work? I don't know. It gets a little psychological here. But um, uh, anyways, there's this cool story that, that Clear tells in here about Dutch researchers during the 1970s energy crisis. Um, they noticed something funny was going on. There was like a certain cluster of homes that we're using 30% less energy. And again, middle of an energy crisis, looking to conserve energy, big deal. And all of a sudden they look at these cluster of homes, they're like, wait, why, what's going on here? Why are these guys using 30% less energy? And they looked into why and they figured out that it's because their energy meters were inside their homes in their main hallways, as opposed to being outside or in the basement. So these guys were just walking by their energy meters nonstop and being like, oh, I could probably turn that down a little bit. I could, I probably don't need, or, or like, oh, we're, we're using a little too much energy today. Like, let me like throttle that back a little bit. And so again, humans, we're lazy animals. We do what's easy. So it's all about uh, controlling and designing your environment. So Clear gives some cool examples in here. He's like, if a bowl of cookies is always on the counter, you're going to eat cookies. If it's a bowl of fruit, you're going to eat fruit. Like, try it. Um, if beer is at eye level in the fridge, you're going to drink it. If you have to go outside, if you have to go like to the outside fridge to get it, eh, there's a little bit more friction. So you want that more friction for less desired behavior, less friction for more desired behaviors. This is not rocket science, but it is shocking how much our environments shape our behaviors. This is why designing environments to guide us in the direction that we want to go is so critical because whether you like it or not, your environment ultimately controls you. I don't know if you believe this or not, but I'm telling you, I do. I 100% I do. It reminds me of the famous Winston Churchill quote, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. I think he was talking about um, how they should design uh, parliament um, uh, at that time. I could be wrong. Don't fact check me. So anyways, environment design, super important. One point here that clear brings up, he points out that our behavior is often context de dependent. So insomniacs find it easier to sleep if their bed is reserved for sleeping only. Um, if you work from home, it's easier to disconnect if quote unquote work is in another room 
or even like if you live in a tiny apartment, like another part of a room. Clear says we should try to avoid mixing contexts. Um, so mixing contexts would be something like doing work on the couch because what happens then is the easier habit that's associated with that context is going to win out. So if you're trying to do work on the couch, but you also watch Netflix on the couch, um, sorry, but you're going to be battling willpower in that situation. Netflix is probably going to want to win. And once you add self-control to the mix, uh, it, things get harder. So speaking of self-control, this idea is deeply embedded into our culture that people who are disciplined or have tons of willpower are the ones can do, you know, whatever it is, avoid smoking, get in shape, do this, do that, right? The, this guy is so disciplined. Actually, um, what the research what the research shows, and as Clear points out, is that the people who are doing all these impressive things <clears throat> are just better at structuring their environment. So they don't need to use self-control. So to recap law number one, make it obvious. We want to be aware of our behavior. We want to tie the cues for our habits to time, location, or other habits, aka habit stacking. And we want to intentionally structure our environments to be the invisible hand nudging us in the right direction. Okay, so let's talk about law number two, make it attractive. The more attractive an opportunity is, the more likely it is to be habit forming. Okay. That uh, makes sense. Uh, the food industry has got this pretty well figured out. They uh, know how to make food really attractive. They put in the most diabolical combinations of sweet and salty and different textures. They just get us addicted, right? It's so attractive. Social media companies obviously doing the same thing. I think TikTok is crack, cocaine, and these guys know what they do. Uh, to make it attractive and irresistible to us. So we need to figure out how to use some of these forces for good to help us do things that we actually want to do, not things like we don't want to do, like scroll social media forever and eat fast food. So in other words, we need to figure out how to harness dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter most closely associated with all things desire. Clear says that habits are essentially a dopamine-driven feedback loop. Every behavior that is highly habit-forming, whether you're talking about taking drugs or eating junk food or browsing social media, is associated with higher levels of dopamine. Now, it's worth noting that dopamine is not some big bad boogeyman. Only for pleasure junkies, it also plays a critical role in many neurological processes, including motivation, learning, memory, movement, and more. So yeah, actually we need dopamine. Um, but we want to leverage it here in, in positive ways. So the key insight here as it relates to habits, Clear says, is that dopamine is released not only when you experience pleasure, this is really important, but, well, but also when you anticipate it. Mm, think about that for a second. The dopamine is released not only when you experience pleasure, but also when you anticipate it. So for instance, gambling addicts get a spike of dopamine right before they place a bet. Cocaine addicts get a spike of dopamine right when they see the white powder. Our brains are predicting that a behavior will be pleasurable. This is one reason why anticipating something like a vacation um, or even kids anticipating Christmas morning can be more pleasurable than the actual thing itself, according to Clear. Now, there is some nuance here. The first time you do an activity that is pleasurable, let's say browsing social media, you get a dopamine hit when you get the reward. So when you do the browsing. But then after that, you get the dopamine before the activity. But interestingly, not from the reward because the pleasure was anticipated. Isn't that interesting? So the first time you do it, the actual act of browsing social media gives you dopamine. From there on, it's doing things like when you grab your phone or see your phone, you get the dopamine. But when you actually browse the social media, you're not getting the dopamine hit because it was already expected. That's pretty interesting stuff here. So for habits, um, how do we harness this? So we need to make the expectation of performing our desired behavior pleasurable. A one way to do this is something that Clear calls temptation bundling. So like, let's say you're like, oh man, my email box is like out of control. I really want to 
like get on that and get to inbox zero. And let's say, but you're also like, um, I really want to get a pedicure. All right now, can you pair those two things together? So basically, like, can you say to yourself, I will only get a pedicure if I clean out my inbox while I do it. Right. So you're finding a way to make this thing that you want to do attractive. Remember, we're talking about law number two, make it attractive. I'm not a big pedicure guy, but I can see that attaching pedicures with inbox cleaning could make inbox cleaning more attractive. Okay. Makes sense to me. Um, you can also use habit stacking in this regard, by the way. So um, you could do something like, after I do 10 push-ups, I get to do something I want, like check Facebook. And the idea here is eventually you'll look forward to doing the 10 push-ups because you know you get the uh, Facebook as a reward. Now, speaking of Facebook, let's talk about the enormous influence that our friends and families have on our habits because it cannot be understated. So um, it might not be surprising for you to know that not only are we products of our physical environments, as we were earlier talking about, but also our social environments. Now, Clear reminds us that one of the deepest, most innate human desires is to belong. In fact, throughout most of evolutionary history, being cast out of the tribe was a death sentence. So this very ancient desire to belong is still very much part of who we are today. Um, we learn our social norms from an early age. Right? Think about all the things that you just kind of naturally get through osmosis by hanging out with your family and friends, uh, You know what holidays you celebrate, what religion you are or aren't. Even small things like Clear gives the example, like how much to spend on a child's birthday. Like you don't just like make some conscious decision, like come up with some figure by doing something. You just like figure like, what what, what do people do? Like what, what do we normally do? You know? Um, so he points out that we're really influenced by um, uh, people around us. And in, in, in particular, three groups, the close, the many, and the powerful. So the close is like, you know, let's say our immediate family or friends, like we learn just by watching, like how do our parents handle arguments? Um, what are the words that our friends use? What are the foods that our spouse eats? So without even recognizing that we mimic people, even things like body language, like we, we mimic those around us. So Clear Sight's a study which found someone is 57% more likely to become obese if they have a friend who became obese. That's pretty wild, right? Um, fortunately, it can work the other way around. And in fact, one of the most effective things you could do to build better habits, Clear says, is to join a culture where your desired behavior is the norm. That's another sneaky, awesome quote. So join a culture where your desired behavior is the norm. And of course, it's also helpful when embarking on change to be part of a group. Um, think about if you're trying to lose weight or train for a marathon, um, being part of a group uh, is really helpful. So there's the close, the many, the powerful. The many, um, you know, we rely on and we're influenced um, by the wisdom of the crowd. So think about things like Amazon ratings and Yelp reviews. Um, those are usually helpful, but they can work the other way too. Like, especially when the crowd practices a non-desired behavior, it can actually become a massive uphill battle uh, to push back and act uh, differently. So Clear states when changing habits means challenging the tribe, change is unattractive. When it means fitting into the tribe, it's very attractive. I've, I've kind of had some experience with this in the past years. I quit um, alcohol. That's very pretty much going against the grain. Um, so that's been an interesting experience. Um, and then finally, the, the so close to many, the powerful, the powerful, he just points out that humans are status junkies. We will all want titles and awards and to be seen as smart or rich or accomplished. So we tend to imitate those who we admire. Maybe it's the CEO of our company. Maybe it's um, our favorite fashion influencer. So whatever, if a behavior gets us approval or respect or praise, we find it um, attractive. And remember, we're talking about law number two here, make it attractive. We're looking for ways to make it attractive. Now, um, when we're trying to find and fix our bad habits, we really need to understand their underlying causes first. So you might think that the underlying cause for you eating a taco is just, hey, I wanted a taco. Or for browsing social media, hey, I just want to see what was happening, right? Clear shows us that what is actually going on here is these are just modern behaviors or vices in some cases that attempt to address the real underlying motivations we have, which tend to be timeless and closely related to survival. So these are broken down into, there's like, let's see, uh, seven of them here. So the here, here's the kind of um, underlying motivations, again, that he says are timeless. Um, we uh, 
need to conserve energy, obtain food and water, find love and reproduce, connect and bond with others, win social acceptance and approval. Those two sound similar. Uh, reduce uncertainty and achieve status and prestige. I think there's some overlap in these. Uh, but he says, you know, things like, are you using Tinder? What you're really trying to do is find love and reproduce. Uh, are you posting nonstop to Twitter to try to gain followers? What you're really trying to do is achieve status and prestige. So the point is like to look, I guess, a little bit beyond the behavior that you're doing to say, why am I really doing this? Okay, so again, he says, your habits are solutions to ancient desires. It's kind of an interesting phrase, ancient desires. Now, here's the powerful part, according to Clear. There are many ways to address the same underlying motive. You happen to be using one that maybe was picked up because it was easily accessible or your parents used it or it was how your friends dealt with a problem. But maybe it turns out that that habit is not the healthiest way to deal with it. So, for instance, some people learn to reduce anxiety with cigarettes or alcohol. Others learn to do it by going for a run, right? So same underlying motivation, two different ways to go about um, dealing with that. So whenever we find a habit that successfully addresses a motive, we develop a craving to do it again. Okay, back to that idea of craving. The key, of course, is to find desirable habits, the running, not the smoking, that help to address the underlying motive and to train ourselves to crave those activities at the expense of others. So how do we reprogram our brains to enjoy so-called hard habits? Well, sometimes it's a simple mindset or even language shift. So I love this idea of I get to instead of I have to. And I try to preach it and my wife like actually just reminded me of something of this the other day. I said, I have to do something. She's like, you get to. I'm like, oh, you're turning my own stuff around on me. But um, so you don't have to go for a run. You get to go for a run. You don't have to wake up early. You get to work, wake up early. You don't have to work out. You get to work out. Um, this is like kind of philosophical as well. It's like uh, Alex Toussaint from Peloton has a quote like, man, smile. You woke up today, right? This is just, it's just a, it's just a mindset, right? Like think about how short a time we are alive for, like fix your attitude. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's, that's what this comes down to. So both realities you have, you have to and get to are true. Yes, they're both true, but we do have some choice in the mindset that we choose. So mindset can be an important way for us to embrace hard habits. So let me recap on law number two, make it attractive. We're going to want to use dopamine to our advantage. We can do this via so-called temptation bundling or attaching a behavior we want to try to cultivate with something um, we are uh, we, we enjoy doing already. Uh, we're going to want to keep in mind the enormous impact that our family and friends have on encouraging both good and bad habits and consider this idea of joining a tribe where our desired behavior is the norm. I just love that idea. Um, we're also going to want to remember that our habits are really just addressing primal needs that we have and consider, are there other ways that we can address those primal needs? And finally, we're going to want to look and see if there are any simple mindset shifts we can take that can help us make small, but potentially mighty mindset, mindset shifts. Uh, try it, you know, that there's no downside. Uh, okay. So that's it for law number two. Let's talk about law number three, make it easy. At the beginning of this section, <clears throat> Claire talks through one of my favorite concepts from the book, and that's saying something because uh, there are so many great concepts. But that's this idea of motion versus action, right? So, yeah, you may not be aware of this distinction. Let me explain it to you. Motion, as he defines it, is doing things like planning, strategizing, and learning. I mean, who could say those are bad things? They're all good things, right? But they don't really come with results, right? Planning, strategizing, learning, okay, whatever. Then he's got action. Action is basically doing the thing, okay? So think about this. Instead of planning articles to write, for instance, actually writing them, okay? And so a lot of people, including myself at various times, get caught up in quote unquote motion activities. There's a lot of just motion happening and things happening, but am I actually making progress? Maybe not. Um, so why do we get so caught up in this? 
it it actually is because there's an illusion. We think we're making progress, um, and we're doing so without the risk of failure. Okay, so like, let's say an example could be something like, all right, I want to write a book someday. Okay, let me read ten books about writing books, and then all of a sudden you're like spent like six months reading books about how to write a book, and you're like, why don't I just write a freaking book? You know, like let me just get started and make all the mistakes and figure it out. All right, so. Motion and action. Action is just making stuff happen. Um, there's a danger in motion, and that's that be, that preparation becomes a form of procrastination. And I've been guilty of this many times. And once you start to notice that in yourself, you'll know it's time to make a change. Another way to think about this is practicing is greater than planning. Um, this is uh, the first kind of key takeaway from the third law. And it's basically that you just want to get your reps in. Now, why is repetition important? Well, as Clear puts it, each time you repeat an action, you are activating a particular neural circuit associated with that habit. This means putting in your reps is one of the most critical steps you can take to encoding a new habit. Okay, now quick personal aside here uh, on the motion versus action. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people on my podcast before. Uh, two of those guests have included um, Dickie Bush and Nicholas Cole. I don't know if you know these guys, but they're both uh, writers. They've written books. They've started writing businesses. They're basically have made millions, both of them, off of their online writing careers. And they absolutely just preach this idea of getting reps. Their whole philosophy is just keep taking shots, shot, 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 right? It's like they write LinkedIn posts or tweets or whatever. And they so basically their whole idea is about action, 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 and then keep feedback loop. What do I learn from my action? What, what, how can I implement that in my next action and just keep firing? Um, and it, they have found, and obviously in terms of like the amount of money that they've built and all that kind of stuff, they found it much more um, effective than sitting around for a few months trying to guess what will resonate with their audience. So just keep firing, just keep action, action versus motion. I love it. Um, now, at some point with enough reps, clear shows that you pass a point where the new behavior becomes automatic. In many cases, your non-conscious mind takes over. Again, think back to the teeth brushing or showering. As clear puts it, the frequency with which you practice a habit, let's say walking for 10 minutes every day after breakfast, the more quickly it can cross that imaginary habit line. So, okay, we know we need, <clears throat> excuse me, tons of reps to get a habit to stick. How are we going to re realistically do that? Well, let's think back to the law. We're on, we're on law number three. Make it easy. Easy. Okay. I'm going to tell you something you already know. You are lazy. And I know this already because I am too. And uh, in fact, I know we all are. That is part of the human condition, being lazy. Well, lazy, maybe, maybe that's a little too harsh of a word. But as Clear discusses in the sec next section of the book, um, we're all wired to choose the most convenient option. He says, and I quote, energy is precious and the brain is wired to conserve it whenever possible. He goes on to say, look at any behavior that fills up much of your life and you'll see that it can be performed with very low levels of motivation. Hmm. Habits like scrolling our phones, checking email and watching television steal so much of our time because they can be performed almost without effort. They are remarkably convenient. Oh, man. He's right. The way that Clear puts it is that every habit is just an obstacle to getting what you really want. So dieting is an obstacle to getting fit. Meditation is an obstacle to feeling calm. Journaling is an obstacle to thinking clearly. We don't want the habit. We want the outcome. So we need to do everything in our power to make the habit as easy as humanly possible. Make it easy, make it easy, make it easy. Now, importantly, the idea here is not only to do easy things. It's to make the things we really want to do, the hard things, as easy as possible. Very important distinction. In other words, for our good habits, we want to reduce the friction it takes to accomplish them. And for our bad habits, we want to increase the friction associated with them. Back to this idea of environmental design or physical environment. You know, you set out your workout clothes. That's going to make it much easier for you to work out. It's not only your physical environment, though, like your digital, too. Like we discussed, like deleting your social apps, like that cleans up your environment, makes it much easier to make the right choice uh, not to scroll social media. So the ultimate goal 
according to Clear, is to answer this question. How can we design a world where it's easy, easy to do what's right? So related to this, one idea that Clear talks about that I really like is that he describes habits as on-ramps. And he talks about many decision points that we have during the day that shape the outcomes that we'll ultimately have. So an example he gives is as follows. He says, if he and his wife put on their workout clothes at 5.15 p.m., they are going to go to the gym and a cascade of healthy habits follow. If they don't, then they aren't. And it's more likely they find themselves eating unhealthy food and watching TV. They missed the on-ramp. These on-ramps are particularly critical when trying to get a new habit to stick. Clear has instituted something called the two-minute rule for this, which states when you start a new habit, it should take less than two minutes to do. Okay, this one's kind of interesting. So if he says, let's say you want to read every night. Start this habit. Read one page every night. Let's say you want to run three miles. Start this habit. Put on running shoes every day. Okay. To me, okay. I'm not quite there with him on that this one, but let's talk through it because I think I can get there. If you want to start a meditation practice, just start meditating for one minute every day. Okay. I'm with him on the read one page every day and I'm with him on the meditate. The putting on the running shoes, I can see where he's going, but I'm not totally with him. Um, but the idea is to make it easy to start. Okay, okay, I, I, I'm coming around to, to this now. So we already know that, you know, once we go up that on-ramp, we're much more likely to follow through with the action. The idea here is to make those first two minutes easy. Okay, okay, clear. I'm coming around to this idea now, putting on the running shoes. I understand that first two minutes is easy. Once you got those running shoes on, you're much more likely to go running. I got it, I got it. Um, so you want to write a book? Commit to writing one sentence a day. One sentence, right? Uh, that seems like that's going to take you forever at that pace. But the point is, if I think about it for myself, if I'm going to commit to writing one sentence a day, I'm probably not like writing that as I walk down the street or while I try to feed my kids or something like that. I probably have come to my office. I have opened up my laptop. I have maybe put on some um, classical music in the, in the in my earphones. And guess what? Once I write one sentence, I'm writing more. Okay. It's all of this like floss one tooth idea. You floss one tooth. Uh, you're not going to stop there. So as Clear says, the point is to master the habit of showing up. Instead of trying to engineer a perfect habit from the start, do the easy thing on a more consistent basis. As you master the art of showing up, the first two minutes simply become a ritual at the beginning of a larger routine. Okay, so that's all his whole thing, like two-minute rule, like just get that two-minute habit down. Just get yourself to show up. That's another way of saying just get yourself to show up, basically. Um Okay, so we talked about how to make good habits easier. Let's talk about how to make bad habits harder. So one method Clear talks about is the use of so-called commitment devices, which he describes as a choice you make in the present, which controls your actions in the future. Now, coincidentally, I had the author of a book called Your Future Self uh, on my podcast. His name is Hal Hirschfeld. And we had this whole discussion about a commitment device called the K-Safe. Uh, formerly called the kitchen safe, which is basically like a piece of Tupperware that locks and you can use it as a commitment device. So like, let's say you have a real problem with like chowing cookies at all the times. You can like put the cookies in that thing and give your wife the combination and you literally don't know how to get them. Um, you could do the same thing like with your phone. Like let's say every night during dinner for you want two hours without your phone, you put your, your phone in the K safe so this idea of commitment devices is, is, is pretty cool. Clear talks about um, uh, people, different things that people have done on this. So he talks about people who have their internet uh, automatically cut off at 10 p.m., uh, obviously to avoid like late night scrolling and stuff like that, um, or purchase individual packages versus bulk. That's a pretty good one, um, actually, if you don't want to just like mindlessly eat out of a huge you know, bag or box of something to go with the individual packages. Um, Clear, this is kind of an interesting one. Clear says that when he's looking to restrict calories, he asks the waiter at the restaurant to split his meal and box half of it before he even serves it to him. That's pretty cool. I kind of like that idea. So the key is to make it harder to do the bad habit. Um, this one relates to accountability as well. So like, let's say 
you really want to get up and go for a run every morning at 6 a.m., uh, if you have a friend that you've agreed to meet, it's going to be much harder for you to be like, ah, oh, screw it, I'm staying in bed, uh, if you know that somebody's like out there in the cold like waiting for you. So further to this idea, Clear talks about choices that we can make, often one-time choices that we can use um, uh, to almost lock in desired behavior. So if he says stuff like, if you want a better sleep, take the one-time action of removing TV from your bedroom or buying a good mattress. Oh my gosh. Uh, my wife probably doesn't want me to talk about it, but I had to wean her off of TV when we were um, earlier in our relationship. Uh, and thankfully we, we did that. No TV in the bedroom. Um, if you want to eat less, take the one-time action of buying smaller plates. Um, I do believe uh, in countries like Japan, um, they use smaller plates and there is really something to that. I, I, I actually have tried this myself quite a bit. Uh, just at home on a normal night eating dinner, I try to go for a smaller plate as opposed to a bigger plate. Um, and just these little environmental design things. Like again, we think we're in control of our behaviors. We're not, we're not. We're just slaves to our environment. So like, we got to be smart about setting setting these things up. Um, if you want to be pr more productive, take the one-time action of unsubscribing from email lists. Not Don't unsubscribe from intentional wisdom, though, peeps. Come on. I need you to be reading that. Or deleting games or social apps from your phone. Um, so anyways, there you have it. Law number three, make it easy. Or the inverse for bad habits, make them hard. So remember from this, uh, I want you to remember things like motion versus action. That's a super important concept that I just love. Um, remember we're all lazy, but we can work with that. Uh, and remember things like, you know, making the first two minutes of any habit easy, that's much more likely to get it to stick. Um, and remember some of these one-time actions we can take to make our habits easier or harder. Um, okay. On to the last law, law number four, make it satisfying. We are more likely to repeat behaviors that are pleasurable. No surprise. As Clear states, and I quote, the first three laws, make it obvious, make it attractive, and make it easy. Hopefully these are, you're learning these by heart now. Um, increase the odds that a behavior will be performed this time. Okay, so the first three laws, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy. They increase the odds that a behavior will be performed this time. The fourth law of behavior change, make it satisfying, increases the odds that the behavior will be repeated next time. It completes the habit loop, Clear says. But it can't just be any satisfaction. It, it has to be immediate satisfaction. Hmm. Now, there is something of a mismatch between our near-term actions and long-term effects. So for this, we got to look back to ancient history. Look back for most of our species history. Humans were really just focused on near-term consequences, right? If you hurt a lion, you better run. You don't want to get eaten. Uh, and we didn't pay much attention to long-term effects. It probably, in fact, wasn't until the advent of the agricultural age when we started planning ahead. So the brains that we still have in our heads uh, are not naturally inclined to focus on long-term satisfaction. It's kind of an uphill battle for us. We're operating with very outdated hardware here. Um, so typically, bad habits have pleasurable short-term consequences and harmful long-term ones. So smoking might help you release some stress in the short term, but of course you may well die from cancer in the long term. Eating sweets maybe gives you some short-term pleasure or whatever. In the long term, you're probably gonna gain weight. Good habits, of course, are the opposite. Exercise may be hard, hopefully it's not too painful, but you know, whatever, it's an effort. Um, so, it, but you know, on the long-term side, it hopefully helps us live longer and healthier. You know, writing may be exhausting mentally, but in the long term, it gives us some satisfaction that we've published our work. So in other words, <clears throat> another great quote here, the cost of good habits is upfront. The benefits are later, vice versa for bad habits. It actually reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life. I believe that is attributed to Jersey Gregory. So we're in this constant battle between instant gratification on one hand and better lives for our future selves on the other. The former usually has a stronger pull. We already talked about, we got these brains in our head that were designed 
not for this world we're living in. So the cardinal rule is what is immediately rewarded, again, how we bring this back to habits, what is immediately rewarded is repeated. What is immediately punished is avoided. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. What is immediately rewarded is repeated. What is immediately punished is avoided. So that means that most people will spend their days seeking what Clear calls quick hits of satisfaction. But that's not you and me. The road less traveled is to delayed gratification. And that actually presents an opportunity because there is less competition on this road and there is a bigger payoff at the end. Research shows people who are better at delayed gratification. We all probably seen the marshmallow study a million times. I don't, I think it's a law that if you write a self-help book, you have to cite the marshmallow study. But um, research shows that people who are better at delayed gratification get better SAT scores, lower levels of substance abuse. They have lower likelihood of obesity. They have better responses to stress, even superior social skills. The problem, as Clear states, is that most people already know this. We all know these positive benefits in the future, but the outcomes are seldom top of mind at the moment of decision. When you're deciding to eat the cookie or not, or to stay in bed and skip the workout or not, you're not really thinking about the long-term consequences. Um, this is where the make it satisfying part comes in, okay? This is where we got to use some science to hack our own brains to get us to do the stuff we want to do. So if we want to establish good habits, we need to inject them with a bit of instant gratification. So how do we do that? Well, according to Clear, we need to make the habit feel successful. Clear points out that we tend to remember the end of our habits more than other phases. So we remember when we finish working out, we remember when we finish writing, etc. So how can we inject an element of satisfaction into that part of the habit? And one, uh, one that is consistent with the identity that we're trying to help us build. In other words, a reward for working out shouldn't be like a bowl of ice cream because that's not consistent with what we're trying to build. But maybe a reward is something like using a massage gun on yourself for five minutes. Now, one thing I like to do because I'm always strapped for time is just like something super simple, like putting a check on a calendar. Like, did I work out today? Yeah, boom, check. And it is like sneakily satisfying. So look for ways to make things satisfying. We'll talk about some of this. But eventually, <clears throat> as Clear points out, intrinsic rewards, like a better mood, more energy, reduced stress, they kick in and you become less reliant on these secondary rewards. Like the identity itself becomes the reinforcer. But as Clear states, you do it because it's who you are and it makes you feel good. Um, in other words, to kind of sum up this idea, and again, another great quote, um, Claire says, in other words, incentives start a habit, identity sustains a habit. Okay, incentives start a habit, identity sustains a habit. That's pretty cool. So we know that sticking to habits day in and day out can get monotonous or difficult. Clear suggests a few uh, tactics to consider that could help us with this. One, just like write stuff down. I'm a firm believer in that what gets measured gets managed. Simply writing down what you eat, for instance, every day is one of the most effective ways to lose weight. And actually, it's funny. I'm like five pounds over where I need to be right now just because that time of the year and there's been a lot of like we find carbs around here and not good. But I'm like, okay, I need to just get back to my um, the app I use, uh, which is I think like my carb manager, which is literally to just log everything that goes in my mouth every day and I will like drop that weight pretty quick. So write stuff down uh, is, is, a, is a nice uh, tactic to consider. Um, habit trackers more broadly, he's been around forever. Ben Franklin was a famous user of habit tracking lists, just simply checking boxes on uh, certain behaviors every day. Um, it, it, habit tracking can tick the boxes in terms of um, uh, you know being aligned with some of these laws, being making it obvious and attractive and satisfying. And by the way, one really core way to get habits to stick to is just seeing yourself make progress. And once you see a bunch of check marks and uh, in a row, it's 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 pretty cool to see you're making um, progress. Now, the downside of habit tracking is that people can see it 
uh, it's just like a bit too much or another thing to do. And that's fair. I can totally get that. Um, one way uh, around this is to put a time limit on it. So say something like, I'm going to track what I eat for one month. To me, I, honestly, that's more realistic. Like I was just talking about that carb manager app. Like I haven't had success with that, like using it just ongoing. Like I'm going to just use this every day. I'm going to always track everything that goes in my mouth, but I can do it for 30 days and it can make a real difference. So that's uh, that's one important thing to do. Another way to do it is like look for ways to like automate it. Like let's say you you want your habit to be ten thousand steps a day. Just get an app. I have one on my watch that just tracks it for me. Or you can even build stuff like that into your workout itself. I use something called the Whoop Strength Trainer, and I use it to count reps. Um, but by default, it's it's measuring my progress at all times. So um, write stuff down. Look, consider habit trackers. Um, he recommends visual or physical reminders. Like some people benefit from doing stuff like moving a marble from one jar to another when they do a habit. I don't know if I'm totally there or not yet. I'm using a jar right now to stack wins. Uh, um, that uh, is an idea I, I got from one of my podcasts recently, but I'm using that more as like a less like a big habits thing, but more as like a results thing to remind myself that like, hey, on my worst day when I'm feeling down or not successful, I can look at this jar behind me that's got only one poker chip in it so far, but I can be, eventually I'm going to be able to look at the, like look at all these poker chips in this jar. Uh, I, I must be good at this because I'm stacking all these wins. Um, and then another um, one that I'll just mention is streaks. This one, if you follow my content at all, you know I'm a huge fan of streaks. Um, he talked clear talks about uh, Jerry Seinfeld and how he basically writes a joke every day or writes jokes every single day. And it's like the whole idea is like, again, it's just kind of like getting in reps, but the whole idea is like, Maybe like 95 or maybe even like 99% of those jokes are absolutely terrible, but like 1% or 5% or whatever are absolute gold. And his whole thing is like, don't break the chain, right? And so that's, I love it. I did 483 days of Peloton in a row. Some of that were what some of like clears like idea of like the minimum version of the habit. So I had a bunch of those days where literally just like five minute abs or five minute, you know, whatever. Um, but some of them were like obviously legit rides and runs, whatever. But um, I love streaks. Um, I did like a hundred something days of, of meditating. That's pretty cool to just have that um, don't break the chain idea pushing you on that journey. And my current fascination is Duolingo, which uh, those guys very much understand the psychological power of streaks because they very much build it into the app and like even if you miss a day they're like oh good news you froze your streak so like literally i supposedly i have like a 25 day streak going on there but i've actually missed five days but they're like you earned enough rewards to freeze your streak because they know it's just super powerful to like i'm like oh okay cool my streak is still intact but i definitely have to do it again today so anyways clear um uh points out like okay streaks are great but like what happens when you mess up inevitably life gets in the way even the most impressive streaks get broken. Totally true. Um, but his his rule is this, basically, never miss twice. And he points out another awesome James Clear quote. The first mistake is never the one that ruins you. It is the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. Missing once is an accident. Missing twice is the start of a new habit. Oh, I feel that one right here, James. Yes, I'm with you. So uh, this is where showing up kind of comes back into play. And it's Clear's belief that we make more progress by simply showing up on our bad days than we do when we're at our best on our good days. We keep the streak. In other words, we confirm our identity as somebody who shows up, right? That's so important, that identity piece. I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, right? Um, and we let compounding work its magic. Uh, even if you show up to the gym and do 10 push-ups, that's better than nothing. It's a vote, to use Clear's terminology, for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Don't put up a zero, he says. Two ways to ensure that you show up that Clear talks about. One is a habit contract. Uh, honestly, this one sounds a little extreme to me, uh, but he says, he cites examples of you know people who are like, I'll give my wife $100 to spend if I don't weigh myself every day, or I'll give my trainer $500 if I fail to track what goes in my mouth. Again, that one's not for me, maybe it'll be for you. Um, the second one is, is for me, accountability partners. 
Research shows that if we have an accountability partner, it greatly increases the chance that we'll take action. I talked about how we wouldn't want to leave a friend stranded out in the cold waiting for us to go running in the morning. Um, I've honestly been terrible at this for most of my life. I've always been like, yeah, I know, accountability, accountability partners, yeah. Um, but actually, I, I, uh, I really put this into action earlier this year when I was working on a 30-day, um, 100 push-ups a day streak, and I um, got one, one of my buddies to do it with me, and we started texting back and forth. We would text how long it would take us, and it was so motivating. And I also was uh, publishing that on Twitter, and that was super motivating too. So accountability partners, don't sleep on them. Um, okay, so to recap, Law number four, make it satisfying. Consider ways to make the habit rewarding, especially the end of the habit. So um, it can be as simple, like I said, as checking a box. Um, And remember, it takes incentives to start a habit, but identity to sustain it. You can consider tactics like habit trackers and streaks or even just writing things down. If you do any of those, you're much more likely to get a habit to stick And finally, like I just said, I'm a big fan of trying to find a way to have accountability to someone else on the habit that you are trying to form. So that's it. That is the four laws Um, and just a few more things to cover here. So Clear has a section toward the end of the book, which he calls advanced tactics. And one of the topics he covers there is genes. So how we're what we're born with can make our habits easier or harder. He gives the example of Michael Phelps's uh, naturally long arms and torso as one where genes acted as a tailwind in Phelps's quest to become the most decorated Olympian of all time. The question for you and me is how do we figure out where the odds are in our favor? So genes, of course, can impact our tendencies towards drugs or alcohol, or if we prefer to work in the day or in the night. Um, in fact, Almost everything about our individual traits has a genetic component. Bundled together, Clear says, your unique cluster of genetic traits predispose you to a particular personality. By the way, if you don't believe this, just try having kids. I can tell you I have three of them. It is very incredible that they all came from the same family. It's just amazing how different they are right from the get-go. Um, Clear says that the most proven scientific analysis of personality traits is one known as the big five, which breaks them into five spectrums of behavior. I'm not going to go into this in a ton of detail, but basically it's how um, open to new experiences you are, how conscientious you are, how extroverted you are, how agreeable you are, and how neurotic you are. These these traits, in many cases, are with us since birth. Clear gives the example of a noise being played in a nursery of newborn babies. Some turn toward the noise, others turn away from it. The ones who turn toward the noise have been later in life shown to be uh, more likely to grow up as extroverts, Interesting, interestingly enough. So how does this relate to your habits, my habits? Um, Clear notes that our deeply rooted preferences, and I quote, make certain behaviors easier than others. Now, we don't need to apologize for these differences, but it's helpful to be aware of them as they may change the tactics that we use to cultivate certain habits. So for instance, Clear notes, a person who scores low on conscientiousness may naturally be less orderly and may therefore need to rely on environment design as a strategy. A simpler way to think about this is to find the most pleasant version of a habit that gets you to your goal. So let me give you an example. I've been trying to cultivate a zone two running habit this year. And I've been moderately successful, I would say. Um, But I realized uh, that when I play pickleball, which I just started this year as well, I'm in zone two most of the time and I'm having a lot of fun. So that's just kind of a way that I'm looking at. It's something that I'm like naturally drawn to. I'm like, okay, I can do this. And I just naturally enjoy it much more. So that's probably... Um, a good way to get a habit to stick. Uh, again, we need remember, we need to make these things satisfying. So the more we can lean into habits that are naturally enjoyable, the more likely they are to stick. Um, a few questions that Clear suggests we ask ourselves to figure out what these are. He says, number one, what feels like fun to me, but work to others? So for instance, reading a self-help book like Atomic Habits and then recording a whole podcast of yourself talking about it, does that sound like fun to you or does that sound like a terrible? Probably terrible to you, but it's obviously fun to me. So here I am. Um, 
Number two, what makes me lose track of time? This is a cool one. Uh, it reminds me of the idea of being in a flow state. And um, I've written about that before. Clear talks about flow states in the book a little bit as well. Number three, where do I get greater returns than the average person? Uh, number four, what comes naturally to, more, to me? And number five, sorry, James, I added this one. What are people regularly telling me that I'm good at? Um, sometimes others can see our situations much more clearly than we can. So think about those questions as you're thinking about working with your genes. Um, in summary, Clear states, one of the best ways to ensure your habits remain satisfying over the long run is to pick behaviors that align with your personality and skills. Work hard on the things that come easy. Okay, James, I'm taking another one of your quotes from my newsletter. Um, now, once we establish said habits, how do we stay motivated? Clear talks about something that he calls the Goldilocks rule, which states humans experience peak motivation when working on tasks that are right on the edge of their current abilities. Not too hard, not too easy, just right. He gives the example of tennis. He'd say, hey, if you were playing against a four-year-old, you would be super bored, right? But if you were playing against Serena Williams or Roger Federer, you would probably be a little disillusioned, right? But maybe if you were playing someone who is just slightly better than you, you would be just in that right zone. So you need just enough victories to keep you motivated, just enough mistakes to keep you working hard and learning. Um, so think about that. You need to be right in that kind of Goldilocks zone. Um, we've talked about making habits easy to get them started, but once they're established, we need to make sure that we've got areas where we can keep making small improvements and and keeping uh, keeping ourselves motivated. So like I mentioned before, I use this Whoop Strength Trainer app um, for lifting, and it's just a very cool, easy way to track like my reps and weights and stuff like that. And so like one little tiny thing that I'm always trying to do is like every week, I'm trying to like slightly improve it, right? So if I'm lifting a certain amount of weight in my bench press, for instance, like I'm probably not moving up my weight every week, but like, if I did six reps of this weight last week, can I do seven this week? And just trying to continue to make that, um, uh, make progress uh, over time. So um, uh, one other point here, Clear says, we also need to learn to embrace boredom. So Clear asked a trainer of elite weightlifters, what separates the truly elite from the merely good? The answer, the elite ones are the ones most able to handle the monotony of the same lifts over and over again, day in and day out. So this comes back to the idea of showing up even on your bad days, of not putting up to zeros. At some point, you're not going to feel like fill in the blank, lifting weights, going for a run, writing 10 pages, whatever. But if you show up and do it and eventually learn to embrace that monotony because you know what it's earning you, you know what it's helping you become, then you've got a chance to become truly excellent. Um, so that ability to stick to the schedule is, to use Clear's terminology, what separates professionals from amateurs. Okay, so just show up, show up, that's it. Now, um, we've spent a lot of time talking about the benefits of cultivating good habits. Are there drawbacks to maybe? Clear points out that if we're not too careful and our habits get too much on autopilot, we can stop paying attention to little errors. Let's say in our weightlifting form, or we can get overconfident and not seek feedback or improvement. There's also the risk that our identity somewhat ironically becomes too static or fixed based on our current habits. He argues that we need to build in natural periods of reflection, maybe a year end review, for instance, to check in, to see how we're doing on our current habits. And if the ones that we are currently practicing are still serving us, I've heard clear talk about different seasons before that we go through in life. So maybe there's as an example, maybe there's like a before kids season, or maybe there's like a during kids season. Maybe there's an empty nester season, just as, as an example. Um, a different set of habits may serve us in each of these seasons. Maybe the seasons are much shorter than that. I don't know. Um, so it's best not to think of any habit or routine as permanent, just appropriate for a season. Along these lines, clear cautions us that we need to be careful of our identities becoming too fixed. So we all know athletes or CEOs or even soldiers coming back from war who find themselves lost when the careers that they identified with so much come to an end. Um, Clear says that when chosen effectively, an identity can be flexible rather than brittle. 
So instead of something like, I'm an athlete, you could say, I'm the type of person who is mentally tough and loves a physical challenge, right? That's much more pliable. Instead of, I'm a CEO, maybe it's like, I'm the type of person who builds things and creates things or leads people, et cetera. Again, much more flexible. And if you have a big change, uh, easier to sort of uh, overcome that hurdle mentally. Um, he uses a passage from the Tao Te Ching, which I love, uh, which I'm going to read here. Um, he says this. <clears throat> This is attributed to Lao Tzu, again, from the Tao Te Ching. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Men are born soft and supple. Dead, they are stiff and hard. Plants are born tender and pliant. Dead, they are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and stiff will be broken. The soft and supple will prevail. Okay, so I thought about how to end this podcast, and I decided I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Clear's conclusion chapter is nearly perfect, and it is um, it's great. So I'm just going to read it to you. Apparently, I got really lazy at the end of planning this podcast because I just decided to read some stuff to you. But let me read this to you. I think it would be a nice way to close it out. <clears throat> Conclusion. The secret to results that last. There's an ancient Greek parable known as the Sorieties par Paradox, which talks about the effect one small action can have when repeated enough times. One formulation of the paradox goes as follows. Can one coin make a person rich? If you give a person a pile of 10 coins, you wouldn't claim that he or she is rich. But what if you add another and another and another? At some point, you will admit, you will have to admit that no one can be rich unless one coin can make him or her so. We can say the same about atomic habits. Can one tiny change transform your life? It's unlikely you would say so. But what if you made another and another and another? At some point, you will have to admit that your life was transformed by one small change. The holy grail of habit change is not a single 1% improvement, but a thousand of them. It's a bunch of atomic habits stacking up, each one a fundamental unit of the overall system. In the beginning, small improvements can often seem meaningless because they get washed away by the weight of the system. Just as one coin won't make you rich, one positive change, like meditating for one minute or reading one page each day, is unlikely to deliver a noticeable difference. Gradually though, as you continue to layer on small changes on top of one another, the scales of life start to move. Each improvement is like adding a grain of sand to the positive side of the scale, slowly tilting things in your favor. Eventually, if you stick with it, you hit a tipping point. Suddenly, it feels easier to stick with good habits. The weight of the system is working for you rather than against you. Over the course of this book, we've looked at dozens of stories of top performers. We've heard about Olympic gold medalists, award-winning artists, business leaders, life-saving physicians, etc., etc. Each of these people, teams, and companies we've covered has faced different circumstances, but ultimately progressed in the same way. Sorry, I didn't tell you about all of this. Um, through a commitment to tiny, sustainable, unrelenting improvements. Success is not a goal to reach or a finish line to cross. It is a system to improve, an endless process to refine. In chapter one, I said, if you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem isn't you, the problem is your system. Bad habits repeat themselves again and again, not because you don't want to change, but because you have the wrong system for change. As this book draws to a close, I hope the opposite is true. With the four laws of behavior change, you have a set of tools and strategies that you can use to build better systems and shape better habits. Sometimes a habit will be hard to remember and you'll need to make it obvious. Other times, you won't feel like starting and you'll need to make it attractive. In many cases, you may find that a habit will be too difficult and you'll need to make it easy. And sometimes, you won't feel like sticking with it and you'll need to make it satisfying. This is a continuous process. There is no finish line. There is no permanent solution. Whenever you're looking to improve, you can rotate through the four laws of behavior change until you find the next bottleneck. Make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, 
make it satisfying round and round, always looking for the next way to get 1% better. The secret to getting results that last is to never stop making improvements. It's remarkable what you can build if you just don't stop. It's remarkable the business you can build if you don't stop working. It's remarkable the body you can build if you don't stop training. It's remarkable the knowledge you can build if you don't stop learning. It's remarkable the fortune you can build if you don't stop saving. It's remarkable the friendships you can build if you don't stop caring. Small habits don't add up, they compound. That's the power of atomic habits. Tiny changes, remarkable results. I told you that was a good chapter. So there you have it, my friends, Atomic Habits. What an awesome book. I highly encourage you to buy it. Print, audio, Kindle, whatever. Um, By the way, I think I first listened to the audio, then bought the print because I was like, I need to highlight 27 million things in this book. Um, Now, listen, this is a new series for me where I'm helping to bring to light some of my favorite books in the world of self-improvement. And I very purposely chose Atomic Habits as the first book to cover because it's fantastic. So I, I really hope you enjoyed this and some of the takeaways here. And again, uh, I'm going to put them in my newsletter. So a couple of housekeeping items uh, along those lines. If you want more on this topic, um, I'm writing this up in my newsletter. Go to gregcampion.substack.com. Um, it's one email every other week. Sometimes it's not. I need to get in. need to use Clear's uh, systems because sometimes it's not every other week. But uh, regardless, don't worry. I won't spam you. I promise. Also, I always share my current content diet in every newsletter. That's all the podcast books, articles that I'm reading. A lot of people tell me that that's actually their favorite section. But lastly, since this is a new series within the podcast, I'd love to hear what you think. Drop me a comment. Uh, wherever you're listening or watching, tag me on Twitter, aka X, I'm at, at Gregory Campion on that one, or just reply to my next newsletter. I read and usually respond to all those emails. And um, that's it. I, I really want to hear what you think about this uh, this new episode. Type, uh, tell me if you love it or hate it. Okay, my friend, thanks so much for giving me some of your valuable attention. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, and I will see you next time.